What I want to talk about is share. Uh, but first, uh, just a little prior history about how we got in the U.S. to where we are now. Um, <clears throat> NIH's PubMed Central started modestly in 2000 with two journals. Voluntary submissions encouraged in 2007, and when that didn't yield sufficient, there was a surreptitious move on an appropriations bill to require mandatory uh, submissions. And that still didn't yield as much as was hoped. And so starting earlier this year, NIH has instituted a penalty where failure to submit uh, would result in delayed uh, renewal of a grant. And I think this doesn't reflect, uh, I think, at all any objection by faculty. It's just not a way they do business. And it's a lesson to us as we go forward to try to change faculty behavior, make it easy for them to submit, because ultimately it, it will be in their in their interests. But the NIH success, uh, viewed at least as success by some, spurred a desire to expand that. Uh, the Federal uh, Research Public Access Act was introduced in 2008, and it called on <clears throat> all federal agencies that funded $100 million or more a year in extramural research to build public repositories public access repositories like, not necessarily exactly the same as NIH, the goal to provide free public access to the results of federally funded research. Uh, the embargo period in that legislation was no more than six months. AAU endorsed the goals of the legislation, but we did register some concern about that embargo period, which is half of what NIH had. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, there was an ill-fated Research Work Act introduced by some publishers that would have had the effect of, of making PubMed Central itself unlawful. That was a disastrous effort. But it, it signaled uh, a deep division between publishers, librarians, university provosts and presidents, public, acts or public interest groups. And in that cacophony, the then chairman of the House Science and Technology Committee, created something called the Scholarly Publishing Roundtable. Um, some of you have heard me say that I uh, became chair of that by virtue of my viewed objectivity as being the least informed member of that august group. But it was a good group of university administrators, librarians, uh, publishers, both commercial and non-commercial, with the goal of trying to bring these different perspectives together in some agreed to way of promoting public access. The core recommendation was in fact for all federal agencies to provide free public access to the results of federally funded research as soon as possible after appearing in a peer reviewed journal. The as soon as possible was of course pretty open ended, but necessarily so. I think the group thought that <clears throat> different disciplines would need different kinds of circumstances, but we did strongly endorse the goal. Um, <clears throat> then that led, I think, to some concerted action by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, the OSTP conducted a quite intense uh, public forum on public access uh, December 2009, uh, January 2010, and it got an enormous amount of input, as you can well imagine, ranging all, all sets of views. And there was a period of inactivity, and then in earlier this year, in February 22nd, John Holdren, the president's science advisor and the director of OSTP, issued a memorandum increasing access to the results of federally funded research which called, it's a broad directive, called on all federal agencies funding $100 million or more to develop public access policies that we had heard before that was in the legislation that had been introduced. Smart to have some overlap. Free public access to the results of peer-reviewed articles. And in this OSTP memorandum, they didn't specify an, uh, uh, an embargo period, but they told agencies 12 months uh, after appearing in a peer-reviewed journal was sort of the default guide. There were provisions for adjusting that, increasing or decreasing, 
agencies working with their stakeholders to, to work that provision out. The memorandum covered both articles and data, and it called to, <clears throat> on agencies to develop policies that would optimize search archival dissemination features that would promote accessibility. It called on these agencies to ensure interoperability and long-term stewardship, and I think very importantly, that they were to develop their policies in open, clear consultation with external stakeholders. <clears throat> the um, directive covered 11 federal agencies. There are 11 agencies that fund $100 million or more. Um, the way Congress is going this, the, currently that may be reduced to a three or two or something, but at least right now there are uh, 11. But interestingly, 22 agencies have indicated an interest in participating. There is broad interest among uh, US federal research funding agencies in promoting public access. Agency plans were submitted to OSTP in August. OSTP and the Office of Management and Budget are now reviewing those. And <clears throat> full implementation is expected by 2015. That may be, that may be optimistic, but at any rate, that's the target right now. Most likely, some agencies will choose to develop their own repositories. Uh, some may contract with NIH to use PubMed Central, but then we have the, the sort of the two big initiatives, Chorus and Share, which are proposing to create external distributed repositories to help implement the OSTP public access objectives. So now let me say, uh, talk about Share. You know, I, I'm not a fan of acronyms, and I particularly, if you notice, we had to capitalize not only the S, but the H on shared to get our damn acronym of SHARE. Um, it is now the case in, in the US, you cannot introduce a bill in Congress without some kind of acronym, and it really makes it goofy. But anyway, here we are, it is SHARE. Uh, but the publishers have chorus, and I bet not more than one or two of you can translate chorus into its words, but um, anyway. SHARE is a cross, will be a cross-institutional network of digital repositories. Our basic goals are to ensure access to preservation and reuse of the results of federally funded research. We want to be able to enable university researchers to submit research articles to federal agency designated repositories using a single common user interface and SHARE will package and deliver the relevant metadata, files, uh, and links. A key objective is to ensure compliance with agency requirements and make it easy on the individual investigator. Now, why are we doing this if the agencies or publishers could do uh, similar things? First of all, knowledge creation, dissemination, and preservation is a core mission of universities. I mean, that's one of the main reasons we exist. We have an interest in collecting and preserving the scholarly output to assure access to that output, but also for internal operational and analytic purposes. I mean, th this information is relevant to issues like tenure and promotion. <clears throat> Making research articles, data, and their associated metadata publicly accessible for reuse, text mining, data mining, and machine reading, all of that will enhance and accelerate the creation and discovery of new knowledge again. That's what universities are about. The multiple requirements from multiple key agencies, that is a likely outcome of this OSTP process. The memo that John Holdren issued in February called on agencies to the extent possible to use common compliance regulatory requirements, submission requirements, but that's not likely to completely occur. So if we've got 22 agencies with sometimes conflicting requirements, we've got a huge compliance problem and a huge burden potentially on faculty. 
There was a survey done a number of years ago, recently replicated, that indicated in the US, faculty, while they're working on research activities, 42% of that time is spent just on administrative tasks, not doing the research, but doing administrative stuff related to it. Reportedly, there are 23 steps and several e emails necessary for authors to submit their manuscripts to PubMed Central. And again, the prospect of 22 agencies, each having somewhat differing requirements, all of that can add up to an enormous burden on faculty who are already spending too much time in administrative activities. So SHARE has as a major goal developing a single deposit mechanism for principal investigators. SHARE was developed by AAU by the, and the Association of Research Libraries and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. We've now put together a steering committee of officials. We have an NIH a liaison, association sponsorship advisory input. We had our first meeting, first ever, so last week. This is the group. I, maybe it's hard to see, but we have two pretty sharp librarians as co-chairs, uh, Richard McCarty, provost at Vanderbilt, who was on the uh, Scholarly Publishing Roundtable. Uh, we have the Mackenzie Smith is a very, very knowledgeable librarian from UC Davis. Brad Wheeler, the CIO at, at Indi Indiana, has been heavily involved in a number of national initiatives. He was deeply involved in the creation of Internet 2. There's some very good people here. Uh, the association people, Elliot Shore, Michael Tanner, myself, uh, Cliff Lynch, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, is actively involved, and our lead consultant, Greg Tannenbaum. So I think we have a good group, and they themselves all have contacts within the community for a wide range of expertise. What we came out of that meeting last week with is a decision. It had been focusing on building a prototype. We said, step back. Let's spend the next three months developing a roadmap to document cross-institutional networks, how they will operate to ensure access, preservation, and reuse, and agency compliance. So we, we're going to use these three months to identify current workflows, gaps in those, seek standards-based solutions. We want to adopt existing standards where they're available and fit. But more importantly, we need where new standards are needed we don't want to develop them ourselves. We want to develop them collaboratively with relevant communities. We want to accommodate these workflows to be able to handle not just federal funding, but research, university research funding uh, from other sources, industry, uh, foundations, universities themselves. So we will document the next phases, including uh, developing a share pilot and get a roadmap that leads us to full implementation. We see this as a collaborative project engaging university research, technology, intellectual property, and publishing communities. Our steering committee folks have had conversations already with people from Duraspace, Digital Public Library, um, Crossref, Fundref, I think we see as a key part of, of share. ORCID is critical. And we also are looking to international connections like open air. I mean, I think we all should be thinking about building these repositories of the results of research so they can be interoperable, they can be interconnected. And this is just within countries. It's across, it's going to be, end up being a global enterprise if we, if we do it right. Now, <clears throat> some final comments on share and chorus. There has been, as, as we all know, a, a troubled history, to put it euphemistically, between universities and uh, publishers in interactions on scholarly publishing. Over the decades, there's been clear, necessary interdependence, collaboration, but also confrontation, and I think sometimes almost open warfare. There, 
I mean, there are a number of ways, number of issues we have to look at to try to get these two communities working well together, which I think is a, is a critical outcome. But two essential principles I would assert, this is just me, first of all, recognizing that the essential costs of publishing must be met. I think particularly with the advent of the digital revolution, there has been a tendency within some sectors of the university community to un underemphasize not only the cost, but the value of publishing. This is something we can sort of do uh, easily now. And that would be a disastrous result to fail to recognize the, the significant cost and the value resulting from that. But on the other hand, the research that's reported in scholarly publishing grows out of largely publicly funded university research that is intended to benefit the society that provided those funds. And I think it's essential that pricing policies reflect that reality of, of, a, of a public mission for this research, and I don't think those pricing policies have always done so. The scholarly publishing roundtable itself was a major effort within the US to try to bring these disparate points of view together toward a common purpose of advancing public access to the results of federally funded research, indeed to the results of all research. And I think we made a, a lot of progress, although I must remind us that two of the 14 members of that roundtable um, did not sign on to the final report's recommendations. The representative from the Public Library of Science didn't sign on to, to simplify, oversimplify, because the recommendations didn't call for enough government input into the operation. And the representative from Elsevier didn't sign on because he thought the, the recommendations called for too much government involvement. So we still have these polar views that we have to deal with. But I think that the round table did accomplish a lot of good. I think you can see many of its recommendations and intent bedded in the OSDP policy directive on public access that John Holdren produced in February. But there still remains a lack of trust that we have to deal with. We have genuine conflicting, but we also have genuine overlapping common interests and goals. And the OSTP public access policy process may provide a new opportunity for mutual benefit, beneficial cooperation. Uh, in, 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 in that pursuit, officials from SHARE and CHORUS uh, met together in August to discuss their initiatives and explore areas of possible collaboration. We agreed to work jointly on persistent identifiers and on metrics, two critical parts of implementing any large-scale uh, federated network of repositories. So I look forward to continued cooperation and collaboration among universities, federal agencies, and publishers to implement the OSTP public access policy and to the integration of this US initiative with comparable projects in Europe and elsewhere in pursuit of the shared public benefits of scholarship and its products. So I hope we can go forward in a, in a positive way. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Are there uh, any questions from the floor? Maybe, John, if I, oh, uh, oh, I've got two over here. Thanks. Hi, John, it's Alicia from Elsevier, and I was wondering if you had any advice for our community about steps we could take to make continued cooperation and collaboration in the space easier um, for folks in your community to welcome and trust and embrace. Thanks. Uh, I think um, as we started in, in our meeting in August, um, Alicia was there, uh, stepping back from the big sort of ideological divides and identifying kind of practical, pragmatic issues which 
both publishers and chorus and universities and share uh, need to solve and, and, and you know, getting onto concrete issues, you know, like metadata, these sorts of things. So we, we start on specific projects where it's in our mutual interest to find common solutions, and I think maybe we can build out from there. Uh, that's my best suggestion, but I think it's a good way to start. John. Fred Dilla, American Institute of Physics. Do you think we could aid in that last suggestion of yours by just following money? We know in the U.S. any federal agency is not going to be looking at increasing funds for research in the near future. And um, universities have their own concerns about funding their full array of things. And so do publishers. So don't you think a, a very common goal is to share resources for a common solution and just save money on all three accounts? Uh, Fred, I think that's an excellent idea. And to the extent that we can get more tangible about that, um, that and I think there's a recognition when we've had conversations within the university community that we do intend to build share and we, we are a lot farther from having the capacity that publishers have and have had for a long time to carry out their business. But <clears throat> much of what we hope to do will be for the benefit of institutions themselves. Uh, but I have to say that when we've sent out the share proposal in its early forms to our, to our campuses, um, we've, much of what we've heard is, well, what about the cost of this? Where, where's, the, where's the cost going to come from? You know, universities are such dig, disaggregated, complex institutions that the money in, in Department A is invisible to the money in Department B, and, and so uh, often we'll have an initiative within a university with the library and the chief information officer to be building an institutional repository that others, administrators, and certainly faculty are oblivious to. Um, so this activity is going on, but as we expand and systemize it, that will cost money. And particularly if we do it right, it's very complicated. And if there are some things, for example, that publishers already have in place that we both can use, uh, that's going to save uh, a fair amount of money. And I know Chorus has been pretty good at, at indicating, and I've had conversations with people at OSTP uh, within the federal agencies. The issue of money is, is a big issue. Uh, I've talked to folks at NIH that they've been divided about this. Uh, NIH officials like the goal. Everybody, but if you're, if you're a researcher, you want people to, to know about, to learn about the results of your research. If you're a federal agency like NSF, you're proud of what you do and you want that information out there, but their budgets are so tight and the prospect in the near future is so grim, some of them are saying, well, wait a minute. You know, building uh, an NSF repository, if we do it internally, is, is not a zero dollar thing. Where are the dollars going to come from? Are we going to take them from research to build this? Um, so to the extent that universities have, or certainly publishers have, capacity that can help the federal agencies implement the goals of this, uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's, that's a good point and a good way. It's, so it's not just universities and publishers. It's universities, publishers, federal agencies trying to figure out a cost-effective way to achieve a goal that they all uh, support. Hi, John. Peter Hello, Gibbler. Peter. Hi. Uh, I used to be, as, as you know, with the Association of American University Presses, and one of the things that has always concerned me about uh, mandates, the members of AAUP are very largely publishers in the uh, social sciences and humanities, not in the sciences. But I've always been concerned uh, about what I'll just call mission creep. Uh, for lack of, better, of a better word, and I have a kind of two-part question in, in your presentation. Um, you noted that uh, 11 agencies were originally specified as covered <clears throat> uh, by the uh, OSTP policy, but that 22 have now engaged. Uh, I'd 
like to hear a little bit uh, what, you, what you have to say about uh, that process and why 11 additional agencies signed on and, and really what that means. The other part of the question is that <clears throat> in your, one of your slides about the uh, share implementation, one of your points was that you, were, you noted that you were looking for ways to accommodate uh, workflows for non-federal non funding sources into this work. So that suggests that uh, somehow non-federally funded research is also being swept up in this, in this effort. I just appreciate your comments on those two questions. Well, I, I think on the, the 11 that are sort of required by the OSTP mandate versus the 22, uh, which includes the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, I, I think, you know, I, I'm sure in, to some extent, some agencies or their officials are thinking, well, God, if, if all the big guys are doing this, I better be there too. But I think more than that, it really does reflect uh, these agencies and the, and the good people in them see themselves as public purpose. They're funding, they're funding university research for a public good. And the goal here is to expand public access to that. So I think the agencies that don't have to are trying to participate in the process. Now, the submissions that, that went in in August were widely variable. Some of them were very sophisticated. You could imagine NIH, I mean, they've been doing this for years. They, but there are some other agencies uh, who, who, my understanding is, their, their proposals were really quite elementary and will need a lot of improvement. But I think the the agencies beyond the science agencies, and I think it's terrific that, that NEH is part of that, uh, represents the fact that, and, and I, this isn't unique to the US, but we are so focused on science and engineering, we forget the social sciences, the humanities. AU does spend a lot of time trying to keep Congress and others uh, reminded that it is important to support scholarship across all disciplines. Uh, but I think <coughs> that the, the breadth here indicates the interest across all the federal agencies. It also indicates the need, as the policy states, that all of the agencies should be establishing public access policies with a 12-month embargo as a guideline, but the eight individual agencies will determine what, in working with external stakeholders, what their actual embargo period will be. And there's some pretty good evidence that in some of the humanities and social sciences, uh, a 12-month embargo for, for journals produced in those disciplines might really be problematic, that, that the articles have a much longer half-life. In the life sciences, things move very fast, so there are going to be disciplinary differences. In terms of non-federal funding non sources, that's simply the fact that, that understandably and legitimately, OSTP can only direct policies dealing with federal funds, but university research, it's probably about 60% of US uh, university research is funded by the federal government. So that's 40% that's funded by other sources. Because SHARE is, is something we're trying to put together for institutional as well as federal uh, purposes, we would like to be able to track all of that funding. The, the fastest growing uh, sector for university research is universities themselves. So there's industry, foundations, university research funding. We would like to track all of that. That's all I was referring to there. That, that goes beyond the goals of, of OSTP, but it's in the interest of universities to try to track as much as they can. I think there was one other question at the back previously. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Christopher McKenzie from John Wiley. Um, on that last point you were making, is there any threshold? Um, I, I'm not quite clear, clear on what you were saying about the non-federal funding. So if something is not strictly federally funded, is there a threshold or is that exempted because it has non-federal funding uh, exempted from the mandate? Well, there, there are really two answers to that, Chris. That's a good point. Um, from the point of view of OSTP, what does their directive say about that significant amount of, of 
funding that is, say, funded by NIH and a pharmaceutical company or by NSF and a high-tech company. Um, and I don't know how they're going to work that out. Technically, I suppose they have to capture the federal funding, but what you'd hope is that they go beyond that. From the point of view of universities, is there a threshold if, <clears throat> if, a, if a PI has, has a, uh, a grant that's um, funded 95% by uh, uh, NIH and 5% by some outside group, how to explicitly we, do we capture that? I really have no idea. Our goal is just to try to track, well, our principal goal is to make the results of this university research widely available as soon as possible for free public access and, and wide reuse. We also want to try to capture the, this for, as I said, internal purposes and thresholds. You know, we're just at the beginning of this, so that, there's a lot of detail like that that we'll just have to work out as we go. Only one. Yeah. Yeah, it's really <laughs> cheeky to get to, so thank you for that, Susan. Um, uh oh, cheeky sounds scary. <laughs> it is actually. Yeah. It's a, a piercing and penetrating question, hopefully. Um, you, you said very resonantly, uh, John, that um, there were concerns that the research budgets will fund implementation costs, and, and that resonates with my experience. What would you personally say to funders um, and funding bodies, largely outside the U.S., that argue right now that dissemination is part of research and should be funded through research budgets, through gold open access publishing fees? Um, I'll give you two answers. Um, my personal answer, this is John Vaughn's view, is I've always thought that you know, the federal government in the US is putting in something like $40 billion now in university research every year. That's a clear statement that the government believes that using taxpayer funding to create new knowledge is an important national purpose. That new knowledge does nobody any good until it's out for dissemination and use to, to expand uh, the, the corpus of knowledge. So just in a kind of conceptual way, it seems to me that we should be thinking about not a separation of, but a complete interconnection between creation and dissemination and I think clearly that having dissemination as the cost of dissemination built into that process which funds the research itself is a strong goal. And that could, in principle, result in gold open access. There are a lot of complications to figure out uh, how to get there, keep it under control. You know, you and I have talked about the fact, well, does that mean that Publishers can increase the cost per article over time more easily than they might increase the subscription costs. That is a big worry out there. Um, federal agencies are hard pressed in the US and are going to be just funding the cost of research production. How do they add the cost of dissemination? So, but I see those as complications that are solvable and building dissemination into those processes, whether they're in the federal government or in other sectors, interconnecting the creation and dissemination of, of results of research, I think, is an important goal. But let me shut up and let Howard talk. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you.